Hey everybody, welcome to DBS Films Podcast. My name is Kellen, with me as always is my brother Brendan, and together we make movies with DBS Films. Today's episode, we are explaining how you can make a low-budget indie found footage movie, especially if this is your first feature film. Again, we highly recommend found footage for multiple reasons. We have a whole episode about that. This is the second episode in which we're going to talk about the production and post-production and promotion of your found footage movie. And uh, really, again, if you want to learn more about DBS Films, if you want to be on set with us, be sure to take a look at our Discord channel. We make movies for our fans with our fans. So that is the place to be. Now, where we left off, if you were following our instructions from before, you should have a very concise and not blown out of proportion script. You should also have done a lot of pre-production. You should understand how you're going to film some of the big special effects scenes. You should be comfortable with your actors and confident that they're going to be able to deliver in a lot of the more demanding scenes. And the reason for that is because the production process of found footage, in my opinion, this is what makes it a little bit harder, a little bit easier. There's multiple things, pros and cons, but I would say you have more odds of potentially screwing up a scene in found footage because, you know, worst comes to worst, you might have to do a cut or you might have to do this. Um, so I think it does put a lot more um, pressure on production, whereas in cinematic, you can kind of do a lot of different angles. You can give yourself so much coverage that you basically have the tools to make any scene work. So I would say that's my overall impression kind of on the production side of things. What would you say the pros and cons of production for found footage are? Yeah, I think if as long as you do your pre-production, I think you'll be all right. Um, you know, working with the actors, making sure the actors can hit these these marks and these one-liners or these oneers, not one-liners. The oneers um, is important. You're gonna have two or three minute oneers. Um, blocking is absolutely huge, so you have to either shoot the movie yourself or really work with your DP to make sure that he's in the right spot that he's getting the shots that you want or he or she is getting the shots that you want. Um, because like you're only, there's no other cuts. There's no inserts or anything like that. You have to, you know, move the camera around when the characters are talking, you have to make sure you have to pick which character you want, you know, the camera to be on the objects. If they're passing around a knife or something like that, we had a scene, you know, where they're going around all cutting their hand, I have to choose between showing the knife and cutting the hand or showing the character's face when they're speaking. And we even had one last time where we had two groups of people talking and the cameraman, which is me, was in the middle and I had to do pan left and pan right and pan left and pan right. And I don't know if that was the best way to do that, but if you want to get everybody's, you know, reactions in there, you have to do that. So... A lot of that stuff and how you're going to actually film the movie needs to be done in pre-production. In my script, I had a whole bunch of notes of how I'm actually going to shoot the scene. And obviously that kind of all goes out the window when you're actually shooting because you're getting everyone blocked. And, you know, for us, location scouting and being on location is very rare as far as how much time we get to spend in pre-production on a location. So a lot of the time it's just us going out there bringing the actors out there. And then while they're warming up, while they're rehearsing, I'm trying to figure out the best way to block them and trying to figure out like what shots I want. So that's like the harder stuff. Um, the easy stuff is that if you can get this stuff and you can get the oneers done and the actors are good, it's much more efficient because you don't need to do standard coverage, which is, you know, wide, close up, close up, you know, really tight, really tight. And then you have your inserts with this one. You can get, you know, a three or four minute scene done in literally three or four minutes if you're able to capture it. So it's much quicker than cinematic if you can do it right. If you can't do it right, boy, you're going to be in for a lot of trouble. If you haven't done your pre-production, if you go into this set not knowing what you're trying to do, you're going to be in for a world of pain. Yeah, it's not going to be fun for you. Um, So to give you guys an idea of our standard production, we really keep things straightforward. We try and keep it low. We used to work with, you know, Fresnel lights. We used to have a whole bunch of setups. We do crazy stuff, cords, wires, you know, grips and all of that stuff all over the place. Um, Where we're at now, you know, typically it's essentially, you know, you can talk about the rig in detail, but it's, it's very basic. And a lot of times we either had a little LED light or we had a flashlight as our lighting. But I think understanding your rig and having some type of, you know, um, 
very minimal, uh, very minimal setup is going to go a long way. But understand, yeah, as a as the cinematographer, which again we recommend that you uh, definitely be the. This should be you know something that you are doing when it comes to being an indie filmmaker for this. Um, do you want to walk through just kind of the rig that you're having? Because again. The whole thing here is you're cheating the idea that you're a normal cameraman, which, hey, that means you can just be a normal cameraman. You don't need to have any kind of crazy setups. Yeah, I mean, the whole movie is found footage, so it's shot on the shoulder rig. And I really like the shoulder rig. I think it's quicker. Using myself as a tripod is just much more efficient than having to take it off and put it on a tripod. I can move. Um, it's more dynamic. And as long as you know how to use it, stabilization isn't a problem. So the only con to the shoulder rig is that it's heavy and you're going to have to carry this thing around for eight days for 14, 16 hours. Um, on the last shoot, you know, I was physically exhausted. Mentally, it wasn't too bad on this last one. Physically, um, my legs hurt. So you just got to keep that in mind. You got to make sure you're in shape. Um, we use three lights. Um, we have a little LED that goes on the camera that gives sort of like a flashlight effect. Um, we used uh, two uh, LED panel Falcon Eyes lights, and we happen to have lost one. So if you guys find a Falcon Eyes somewhere in the state of Florida, let me know because it's probably mine. I don't know how we possibly could have lost a giant light, but we did. Um And then we used a flashlight. I literally just duct taped uh, or Dylan duct taped a flashlight onto our camera and we use it as a pov and it's great it looks like someone's holding the flashlight and that's all we needed and here's the thing with lighting you can buy as many lights as you want you have all these diffusers and all these crazy setups i will turn off all the lights and have just one light and it's bouncing off a wall and that'll beat your fancy setup 10 out of 10 times the number one thing I with filmmakers is trying to do these crazy light setups and I will beat you with just no light that's just bouncing off for reflection and the face is silhouetted. Now, maybe this wouldn't work for a Hallmark movie, but we're not making Hallmark movies. We're making horror movies. And the less you show, the spookier it is. Really? I mean, it is something where simple is key so have a you know you need a very and this is again why you know you can make these found footage movies for low budgets you don't need these crazy rigs you don't need dollars you don't need things like that it's basically going to be you going out there and getting the action so i think there's two things i kind of wanted to talk about again you know you have experience now actually filming those i think the first one is you really kind of want to think in and out and i mean this is like how do you get in and out of a scene and this was something that i spoke to you about to some degree and basically at the end of every time we film i'm usually watching all of this stuff and just you know telling them how bad he is on a lot of things and basically you know what you can do more or less is an improvement for experience you know just from what i'm seeing from the editing side of things so i say for the most part you did an absolutely fantastic job the one thing i mentioned i was like hey i think we might want to work on or just keep doing this is basically the little whip pans in and out when it comes to the different scenes because if you do them correctly you're basically allowed to have almost like combining scenes because again the longer you make a scene the harder it's going to be for the actors and everyone so if you can strategically get cut points typically what happens cameraman gets pushed he goes down he brings it back up those little whips turning around allow you to kind of cut in and cut out we did it for pop scares which worked really well so almost kind of whipping to the same point and picking those so i think that's the first technique i want you to kind of talk about um just because i think that's a unique found footage element yeah and i i knew that getting in and out of scenes is going to be difficult it's difficult in cinematic movies um just my editing style i like to hard cut on sound um so when you're watching the shapeshifter which is coming out shortly you'll see a lot of cuts are on hard cuts of sound someone's like opening a beer bottle or slamming something or there's just loud cuts um it's just very seamless um and i really enjoyed editing that movie even though it took me forever to do it with found footage i was working on hard cuts but the scenes would just kind of like linger on a character and then hard cut to the next scene well for the what i kind of didn't as or i underestimated would be like when we do pop scares and we have scene setups that you know require either insert part of the scene and then we move on to the next part of the scene so like if i was going to have a pop scare scene i'd have my actors walking through the woods 
they get to the point where they have to set up for the pop scare and you want to do that pop scare many times because you never know which one's going to work. So you'd have to have some kind of cut point in there. The pop scare would actually happen and you have to have a cut point to get out of that scene. Um, so you're stitching two cuts into a scene that should be a one -er. Now you can do it as a one if you want to, but coordinating all those people, getting your focus and getting everything done is going to be very difficult to block it out. So like Kel said, you need to do the whips. Um, and I thought I was whipping just fine, but I was not whipping hard enough, apparently. Um, and I'm interested to see how that cuts together. I think it's a learning lesson um, on you know found footage. The good thing with found footage is you could probably cut around or just hard jump cut to some of these things and no one will even care. But I do want to see if on some of the whips that aren't very good, if we can actually pick those up um, just by going out in the forest and whipping down ourselves. Because if you have that motion blur, that motion effect, you can hypothetically merge those images into one image and it should be pretty seamless. It's what they did in the 1918 movie um, where they're like, oh, this is a one -er. Now they're just merging images together um, to get it to look like it was a one -er. So I think it's something that's going to be cool that we can test out uh, as sort of like pickups for this one where we can go in the woods and we could try and mimic the same shots that we had because it's really just the woods and a flashlight and then merge them in Premiere and see how it turns out. Um, and if it does work, then that's a very nice hack that we found for found footage because it'll allow us to just get better at pop scares because we'll have time to set up and we won't have to do as many wonders. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays out. Yeah. And again, did absolutely fantastic job. Looks absolutely amazing for a found footage movie. Um, and it's just something where after you go through it, you realize, okay, so this is it. Um, you know, we need to do a little bit more here or there. And I would say that's something you can practice, you know, in your pre-production of kind of getting from one scene to the other, just with those kind of whips and turns. Second thing I want to talk about, and I think it comes from two different points. Um, you know, I think especially in our earlier found footage movies, I would find that we stressed out a lot about how is the camera working? You know, who's holding the camera? And typically we have two cameras. You know, you have basically one person is the cameraman and someone has a little side camera that they're holding. That gives you a cut point. So the one thing I kind of want to talk about now is it's very smart to have a cut point and to think of where you can do cut points, especially for longer scenes. Our monologue scenes, they always have cut points. Why? Just in case. Our actors nailed it, but it typically allows you to have a cut point if you need so. So having a two camera setup allows you to do that. The second thing, though, that I kind of want to mention is don't worry about it that much. You know, I feel in your head, you think about where the cut points are and where it's coming from. Typically, when you watch found footage, you're just watching it. And I don't think we've ever had anyone say, well, where's the camera? And if this person's saying, well, where's the camera? In my opinion, they're not really a found footage fan to begin with, because I find just in the movies, they're very forgiving. So it's almost kind of one, it is smart to have these cut points, but then two, don't overstress about them. Yeah, and I, I think on the I have on my docket for next year when we do another found footage movie, I'm not gonna like I'm just gonna shoot it and just have all these crazy angles and stuff and see if anyone actually says anything because my gut says no one's gonna care. Um I watched the uh the Blackwell Ghost Seven today, um, which is an OG Amazon series back when they were paying 15, 20 cents. Um, the guy made seven of these things. The last one's actually really, really, really good. And there's it's a found footage movie, and there's all kinds of crazy angles. It's like cinematic angles. It makes no sense at all if you sit down and try and figure out like where these cameras are. And they kind of like like make fun of it a little bit because this guy just ha is in a room and he has all these cameras on C stands and stuff. But it doesn't make any logical sense at all. And I went and looked at the reviews. No one cares. So I think like I don't think you need to be as detailed as you think you do. I think the audience will forgive you know the camera and obviously you can't be doing like crazy cinematic stuff if you're making a found footage movie but i just don't think anyone cares i think people like found footage not because it makes sense but because it just is more engaging you it's first person scarier i think that's why they like it i don't think they care who's holding the camera or where the camera is as long as you have that first person angle especially with the pop scares i think people are going to like your stuff 
Yeah, no, that's really something where, and I think again, this goes to when you're first writing and whatnot, like you're you're you know almost kind of limiting yourself. Like, where do we put it or do that? Just power through, you know, like you said, I, I don't think many people are going to mention it. So that's kind of the major ones that I wanted to talk about, just because you know that's what I was saying. You have the experience again of filming, you know, the the most recent found footage one. Is there anything else that you would kind of mention when it comes to just any kind of uh, you know indie filmmaker out there? just tips to watch out for on the production side of things. I mean, just make sure your sounds good in your, your picture, like make sure the stuff you're getting is the stuff you want. Um, because there's no going back in cinematic. I can let the cam. If someone messes up a line or, you know, I hear a mic pop or something, I keep rolling because I know that I'll get the, you know, the rest of the footage and I can use that footage because I can cut around it and found footage. You don't have that, that luxury. If, uh, there's a mic bump or, you know, an actor misses a line, you got to start over again. And it is nerve wracking because you have to get it. Like there's no fixing it. So when I did finish it, make sure you're allocating time to going back and reviewing footage while your actors are there. I break down a scene. I said, all right, guys, give me five minutes. Let me just make sure all the stuff that I have is the stuff that I actually want. I put my headphones on. I listen to it carefully. I watch it very carefully and you just got to make sure you get everything because there is no going back. With cinematic, I've cut around so many problems. If I lose focus, I cut around it. If there's a mic issue, I cut around it. Um, if the actor's lines are not very good, I cut around that. Found footage, you just don't have that luxury. So you really have to be able to um, know what you're looking for and make sure you get it, which is why we recommend being an editor. I know all the problems that are out there. And I'm constantly looking for them. I know which ones are very difficult to fix. I know which problems are very easy to fix. And I'm always looking for it. And I think that's just the mindset you have to have. If you're just a director with no editing experience and you're relying on a DP with no editing experience to say your stuff is good or not, you're going to be in for a bad time. Because when you go back in post-production, you're going to have a lot of issues with that footage. Oh, yeah. And that is not where you want to find yourself. Because, again, if you have poor footage in post-production, you're kind of stuck because, again, the camera keeps rolling. So that's going to go ahead and wrap up the production side. Now we have post-production and then basically tips on promoting your found footage. Um, post-production, you know, honestly, what I would say, we mention it all the time. You want to be an editor. Editing is probably the best skill to have because it will show you mistakes that come up. But I would say if you can make it to this point and you got the good footage, congratulations. Because the biggest thing with found footage, in my opinion, and the reason why we recommended it for indie filmmakers is if you can get to this process, you will have yourself a movie, very high probability of it. Whereas if you get to this process in cinematic, it's going to take a long time. We see years of post-production. We see movies die in post-production. We are currently stuck in post-production on The Shapeshifter, and we have essentially a finished movie with into the forest and i keep joking that into the forest is going to be released before shapeshifter because of this so you want to talk about overall this when it comes to a movie is essentially like having you know a, a nice beautiful plateau before i do actually hop into post-production one thing i want to mention we talk about it a ton in our day-by-day -day breakdown how you should schedule your shoot when you should do certain scenes so without going into detail there we basically say do your hardest stuff right in the middle save your easiest stuff for the end if you want more detail on that, take a look at that. But back to post-production, you know, what are kind of your thoughts in the post-production? Because I love it. I mean, I'm the onset editor. I was basically confirming that we have the shots. I had an entire timeline ready to go. I had the whole movie basically ready to go because realistically it is drag and drop to a good degree of the movie. Yeah, I think this is really where found footage shines. I think in pre-production, it's probably the same as a cinematic movie. In production, it could be longer or it could be shorter. It just depends on like where you are as far as your skill level and how good your actors are and how good you're working with the actors. In post-production, it is night and day. It is going to be so much easier. I am really looking forward to going home for Thanksgiving and just being able to just drop this stuff on there because it really comes down to, all right, what are the best takes? And if you wrote a good script and you got the footage that you wanted to, then your movie's pretty much done. I mean, there's going to be some issues in there that we're going to have to fix and we're going to have to scrap together, but that's just filmmaking. But I mean, I just can't imagine this is going to take more than a couple of weeks um, to get it done. 
where you're looking at Shapeshifter, and I've been working a ton on this movie, and we're going on month four or five now um, as far as just editing this thing. There's so much footage. There's so many different ways to do these scenes. There's just so much like time consuming stuff to get in here. You have to do the sound proper. You have to do the color, like all this stuff. It's just absolutely crazy. The amount of man hours to get a cinematic movie to look good. And this is still an indie budget, you know, cinematic movie. Like this is still very minimalistic. It's a very minimal movie. If you're trying to do something larger than shapeshifter and you're a one man team trying to edit this thing, you're going to be in trouble. So it's definitely a way for us to accelerate our timeline, to shoot more movies, to get better by just essentially, you know, drag and drop and, you know, working with these things in post-production. Yeah, I absolutely love it. You know, it allows you to speed it up. And it's one of the reasons why we're actually exploring to do more found footage ones because post-production is where your movie goes to die. And no matter what, it's going to be one of the slower ones. There's just a ton of stuff that goes through it. And it's one of those processes where like, it's, it's just a little bit shapeless too. You know, you're kind of chipping away details, but there's so much that goes into it. So, you know, I think another element I kind of want to talk about with, you know, post-production um, we have multiple podcasts about it where we just, you know, talk about a detail of how you're kind of naming and organizing those things. Um, but really, if you can have someone on set with you, or if you can, if you don't have someone on set, if you can go ahead and have someone reviewing it as well, too, because I think the biggest benefit that you add is, you know, again, you have to redo those things. And I think the safety net of having me on set as that live editor is just massive, especially for found footage. Now we only really did one different scene differently. Um, other than that, everything was fine. Cause again, I think you have a very, very well, um understanding of you know cinema or just of filming so we had a lot of the stuff that we had but do you want to have a recommendation of again kind of having that onset editor for production just because it is super critical if you don't have a footage because you have no options uh, it's super critical um i mean i was going back and like i said before i was checking all the footage i was making sure i had the sound that i wanted i was making sure i had the picture i wanted and it's still very, very difficult to, you know, tell that you have everything you have with just the headphones and that small little L- LED or LCD um, screen on the back of the camera. You really can't see, you really can't hear everything till you get to the editing point. And, you know, Kel's job is to go there and just make sure that everything's good, that it cuts together fine, that everything looks good. And, you know, be able to put it on there. And then I took a look at it and, you know, I'm scrubbing through this thing to just make sure that really the transitions work out. And I didn't see anything in there. We had one small little scene that we had to fix up a little bit. But this is coming from me with 12 movies under my belt and there's still issues. So I don't understand how... You know, you can be an indie filmmaker and not have an on-site editor. Um, we used to do it. Um, we did it earlier in the earlier days where, you know, we would film the movie and no one would look at anything until we got into post-production. And I'll tell you exactly what happened. We had to do a lot of pickups. <laughs> and I honestly think that an on-site editor, whatever you have to pay them to do it, is worth it because you'll save your money in doing pickups. And I think you'll get a better story and you will, whatever you're paying this guy is going to be less than having to go do pickups. And then if you have to do pickups, there's a good chance that your movie never gets made because you never know those actors are going to come back. You never know if you can get the location again. Um, so I definitely think that the best investment is to have an onsite editor. Cause then also when you get off it, it's it kickstart your pre-product or your post-production So you're already starting with a timeline. You're starting with things that are organized. You can hit the ground running because I think a lot of filmmakers too, they're so beat down with the actual shooting of the movie. They don't even want to look at that footage for a couple of weeks. And then when they get to look at the footage, they have to organize the footage, which could take a couple of weeks. And I mean, you're already two months in without having anything on the timeline. That's a very easy scenario I could see happen to a lot of indie filmmakers. So I think you got to keep the momentum. You always got to keep working. You got to put in a little bit of work each day, but found footage is like found footage shines in the post-production phase. And it is a lot easier. You're not going to get a technical editor 
to really come in there and do it like cinematic um because cinematic editing is a very very difficult skill you're gonna have to have a lot of hours there's a lot of just feeling as far as like pacing the movie properly when to pull you know which cuts or how to cut a movie together that is a skill that comes from a lot of experience and a lot of those editors with that experience are not going to be working on an indie film I'm fortunate enough because I've edited all my stuff that I understand like what to do, but I'm also shooting that and also writing how I edit. So with found footage, I think anybody can edit because it's really just drag and drop as long as there's nothing in there. And even if there are major problems in there, you can outsource it to someone to fix them. So that I think found footage really, really shines in post-production. And that's one of the reasons why we really recommend it. Oh, yeah. And again, I'm glad you brought it up because it was something I was about to mention. Of all of the styles of movies, having that onset editor, we say they don't need to be the best editor out there. You know, when I'm doing it, I'm not looking to make the best scene. I'm looking to make an acceptable scene for the most part. But also the organization's huge. Like having an organized timeline, I basically have bins with all the scenes there. I have all the raw organized there. And then I have a little scene for him to basically take a look at. And it's something that is really, really basic stuff. So you can, you know, you don't need a technical editor at all. Really, I think I could teach someone within like two hours what to do to most parts to get basically like 80% there. You know, are they going to miss some things and some details and whatnot? And maybe a little bit sloppier? Sure. But again, I'm making sure the footage is there and I'm organizing it. And then, yeah, like you said, I mean, like for cinematic i basically have to organize it and have to put the scene together which takes some time and again i usually focus on all wides this i just really have to organize and then drag and drop for the most part and then we're good to go and you know this movie is like 90 percent complete like it really just kind of you know compared to cinematic compared to an actual cinematic you're basically already at picture lock Whereas in cinematic, there's still so much stuff to do. I mean, it's even kind of one where like, I would say we're, you know, still bordering on picture lock in the sense of, you know, there's a lot of different things that we're doing for shapeshifters. So you're going to be able to fly through this process, especially if you have that on set editor um, or, you know, if it is you, then, Hey man, go ahead and add more time to your production days. You know, again, we don't advise it because it works so well to have this happening at the same time, but it's really going to save you in the end. And again, those pickups are going to be brutal, especially if it's like, you know, flying out the actors and all of those different things there. So ideally you get through that with a smooth post-production process. And now we kind of want to talk about promoting your found footage movie. Um, I would say, again, I'm trying to focus in on the things that are different versus um, found footage um uh versus found footage um and cinematic we do have an entire episode on promotion and marketing so those things are going to apply regardless you know to give you guys a quick little recap if this is the first time you're hearing this you need a good cover that's cover art is by far the most critical things out there you need a good title we always recommend split testing that and we need a good blurb um what i will say you know again if you want to talk briefly about how important those things are but then how found footage actually has a very you know powerful impact regardless people have very strong feelings about found footage yeah i mean you always need to make sure you have a cover uh that looks really professional and you have a blurb that's engaging that tells people exactly what's going to happen in your movie or what's going to happen in your movie in a couple sentences like do not have a long blurb Couple two or three sentences is enough. And if you can't tell your story or tell your audience what's going to happen in two to three sentences, um, you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> it's just pretty much it. People are going to be scrolling through endless like carousels. Go look at how Tubi is. It's just a giant website with a whole bunch of covers and blurbs on it. So it's the same thing with Netflix. That's how these things are optimized. People are going to scroll through them. They're going to look at them real quick. And if it catches their attention, they're going to watch a trailer. Got to have a good trailer. And if you don't have either either of those things um, before even people watch your movie, you're going to be in trouble. Um, so you really want to make sure you have that stuff optimized. Um, but yeah, the, the good thing with found footage is there's a lot of people who really like it. And there's a lot of people who really hate it. And I think one of the reasons we were turned off to found footage in the beginning is that people who hate it are very, very vocal and very loud. They do not like found footage and they will tell you they hate found footage and they will just one star you they will be very aggressive on facebook ads um they'll be very aggressive in everything but that's not such a bad thing because even though those people are aggressive they're still watching your movie um they watch the movie and then they just say one star this is found footage i hate found footage 
even though they just watched a found footage movie, it doesn't really make any sense, but whatever. You got paid, you got some engagement, and maybe they'll have some like helpful tips that will make you better as a filmmaker. On the flip side, there's a lot of people who like found footage. And the great thing about found footage people is that they are very passionate. They're equally as passionate as the people who hate found footage. And they're also super forgiving. There are a ton of found footage movies where I watch it. And I'm like, this is the worst thing I've seen in a long time. And I go on the found footage groups and they're like, this movie was pretty good. I liked it. And it's just like, really, this movie was just found footage. Um, there's nothing scary about it. There's nothing interesting about it. It was just people walking around the house for an hour and a half. They love it, though. So it's like you have that built in following. Do not be afraid of negative stuff. Um, I've said it before, as long as you're getting engagement, whether it's positive or negative engagement, people are engaging with your movie. That is a win for you because that means people are watching your movie. You can always go and check the most popular movies and to see if a movie's done really well by how many reviews it has. You know, if a movie has a thousand reviews versus a movie that has 20 reviews, the thousand movie, you know, is probably done much, much better um, just because people are engaging with it. The worst thing you could have happen as a filmmaker is to make a movie and then nobody leaves you a review or nobody engages with your movie because you've made them not feel anything. As a filmmaker, whether people like or hate your movie, your job is to inspire a reaction. And even the people who you know hate your movie, you could be so afraid of getting these one stars, but I kind of like the one stars. I think the people who give me one stars, the people who give me feedback – um, are more beneficial than the people who give me, you know, good reviews. Do I like the good reviews? Yes. Does it stroke my ego? Yes. But, you know, I'm not looking at this as my final product. This is not my magnus opus. I want to continue to make better movies. And the way to get better is to look at negative feedback. I want people to just destroy my stuff. And I, I make it very clear, especially with the Discord, I say, hey, you know, destroy this movie. What would you do differently? How would you do that differently? Um, what do you really don't like? You know, what made this, what made you turn this movie off? And if you keep working on those things and getting better and better, eventually you'll get to the point where there is nothing in your movie that will make people turn it off. And that's how you get a good movie. Um, so it's just learn and it's just getting feedback, but just understand if you're making a found footage movie, you have people who will fight for you, who love found footage, and they will do whatever it takes to, you know, pump you up and you know give you those view minutes and the, and watch your film. And the other side, you can have people who are just very aggressive, and you know they're just jealous that you're a filmmaker, that you're jealous that you're living your dream. And you know if those people happen to give you uh, some feedback that you can use, more power to them. Other than that, you know if they're gonna just be like one star, this is trash, this found footage, I can't help you, man. I'm sorry. Yeah. And I think that's a fantastic thing to bring up because the next thing I want to talk about is there is that community of found footage aficionados. And I'm always going to go back to Ashley for showing us the way she's basically like, Hey, take a look at these indie groups or whatnot. And like I shared our movies and literally every time I share that movie, I would say I at least get 30 comments of people who watch it and say, this is X, Y, or Z. These are my thoughts on this. And that is so critical of feedback, especially as an early filmmaker. I mean, the amount of data we have at our fingertips now compared to the amount of data we had when we first started, I think is night and day. Again, we have our Discord, which is huge, and not everyone's going to be able to you know, cultivate such a, a large following like that. But with found footage groups, you can immediately hop in there, say, I am this filmmaker. Here is this movie. What do you think? And you are guaranteed to get feedback. And one of the biggest things is feedback, as you mentioned. So do you want to you know, just quickly, again, like highlight that, where as an indie filmmaker, I think the vast majority of people open something out there, and it's basically you, you just throw something into a deep abyss and you don't get anything or if you do get something it's one star worst movie ever i hate you and with the found footage groups especially as a first time filmmaker it's going to hone in on the story you know one of the big things that happened that we talk about with into the forest and the um the haunting of the suicide house is it was our first movies that we got critiqued on our story which is huge so you want to talk about how another element with found footage is you're most likely going to get a lot more feedback than you would on a cinematic and as a cinematic Typically, the feedback you're going to get is this looks really terrible because I'm comparing you to literally Top Gun. Yeah, no, the the Facebook groups, um, especially the found footage Facebook group has been just an absolute blessing. Shout out to anybody who if they happen to come across this podcast, I absolutely love that group. Um, 
for two reasons. Number one, um, you're going to get the feedback and they're very welcoming. They're like, listen, we will support found footage movies and we will support filmmakers who make found footage movies. They like it that much. And they understand that, you know, a lot of found footage is, you know, where filmmakers first start. This is their first or second movie, which it should be. And they're willing to, you know, give feedback and they, you know, are a little bit uh, lenient on judging people because they understand it's like your first movie. And a lot of it's very low budget and they understand that. And a lot of people just don't. They expect, like Kel said, like Top Gun Maverick or Black Phone or some kind of crazy production. And to have that support is really beneficial um, because it's in an environment that's coming from a place of, hey, we're helping you get better as opposed to, you know, being, you know, kind of tearing you apart. And I think, you know, for a first, for a first film, uh, when you're a filmmaker and you make your first film, you really think it's going to be like your lottery ticket. It's going to be your big success that, you know, it's going to go and win Sundance and then you're going to become a famous director. And really that's, it's complete opposite that it's going to just absolutely destroy your ego. And if you don't have, if you're not mentally prepared and mentally strong enough to make a second film, that's it. And unfortunately, like a lot of reviewers and a lot of people can get into your head. Found footage group comes from a place of love, um, as opposed to hate, which is always super beneficial. The second thing, and the thing that I think is really beneficial, is they're very good at recommending movies. And we're trying to make found footage movies, and I can go on that group and search it, and I will find all the found footage movies that I need that are similar to the concept that I'm working on now that allows me to just go and have a ton of source material. Source material is great because I can send it to actors, I can show them what I'm trying to do. It's good for me when I'm writing. I could try and see like what worked, what didn't work, what angles I want to do. And it's good for just like finding pop scares and just scary moments that we can, you know, work with uh, or build something similar. Like, obviously, I'm not stealing this stuff. I put my own twist on it. But if, you know, they have some kind of cool idea or something in there that maybe I want to explore, um, you know, it's an easy way to just send it to the actors or send it to writers or just try and figure out the best way to do it. And to have like sort of like a database of people constantly reviewing, constantly leaving feedback, constantly, you know, updating these lists is incredible. Because usually when I have to do a cinematic movie, it takes me a long time to find specific scenes, to find movies that relate to the same thing. Um, for Shapeshifter, for example, it's like the thing. And then there's a movie that came out on Netflix a couple of years ago that deal with Shapeshifter concept. Other than that, there wasn't a lot of stuff and it was very difficult for me to find stuff. Um, it was a lot of like one off uh, made for TV stuff had like the Wendigo and like uh, other stuff like that. Found footage group, complete opposite. I can go on there and be like, hey, I need all the movies uh, that deal with like alien abduction found footage and they will just give you a whole list. So definitely lean on these groups they're definitely here to help you out um and they're super welcoming i am you know forever grateful for the finding uh the found footage movie group so once again shout out to ashley for uh you know bringing that to my attention yep it's great love the found footage i mean i'm actually even thinking i'll probably make a post about this and be like hey you're interested in this and they'll probably be incredibly friendly and they'll, they'll love it so embrace this because it's going to give you feedback it's also going to build your following and i think the last note is you know, indie film and found footage is really closely linked. I think you look at some of the more successful series, you know, you mentioned the Blackwell Ghost, you know, um, Bad Ben. There's all of these multiple, multiple, multiple movies. And I, you know, as a good summary for this, I think this can be one of the easier ways to ease into the industry, you know? And I think, again, for us, we were kind of so turned off personally by found footage. We were turned off by the one star, you know, reviews of people not liking found footage that we strayed away from it. But that was just because we didn't understand. And, you know, to be fair, our movies had a lot of issues that were frankly issues on different levels. But, you know, I think I want to get your thoughts on kind of, if you are an indie filmmaker out this and you are listening to this, found footage can be a way to create a lot of product for a low cost. And again, this is things where as you build your portfolio of movies, you'll get consistent longer term revenue. And I know a lot of found, I, I know a lot of found footage series that embrace this. I don't know very many cinematic at all. You know, I would almost kind of assume we're kind of the one outliers out there 
Um, at least from what I'm seeing, I'm sure there's people out there that are doing it for different ones that we just haven't quite heard about, but on the indie scene, it's typically one or two cinematic and then you're done. But on the found footage, you can see people running with the stories. And I mean, you know, you look at stories such as, um, you know, paranormal activities or whatnot, look how much legs these found footage movies can end up having because of this group and because of these promotions there. So to wrap it up, do you want to just kind of talk about how a longevity as a filmmaker found footage could be the key to it? Yeah, because I think it allows you to create content and not have to suffer in post-production, upload it, get feedback, and make another one. And then if you do hit on one, like the guy who did the Blackwell Ghost did, had a really successful movie, he's just cranking out a ton of them. You know, you can there's not there's nothing stopping you from making one movie and then continually making a series. And that's probably the best way to do it. Because every time he releases a Blackwell Ghost. You know, everyone who's seen the other six is excited for the new one. And he immediately shoots up the charts. It's a very genius model, but he's also a very, very good storyteller. I was very impressed with his uh, his work. Um, but you're seeing a lot of I've seen a lot of other indie filmmakers. Um, and I can't remember his name, but he did the is like the town full of ghosts and he did Deadware. Um, I think he has a new one coming out. He's he's doing a lot of cool stuff. Um, as far as like his pace and it's very rare that people keep up with our pace where we're doing two to three movies a year. Um, but there's actually a lot of found footage people who, you know, will, will make these movies and at a very good pace and they're rewarding their community with content and they're growing their community with content. We've been very, very fortunate to have a really cool score community and just fans who like our stuff in general, but we need to really keep rewarding them. We need to have constant flow of movies where, you know, the last one we had was a murder house, which came out in July. They're probably going to have another one in December. And I think that's six months is like, <laughs> that's a speed run for most filmmakers. But for us, I really think like every three, two, three months, I want to have a new movie for them to watch, to review, to get more discord fans in those movies. Um, that's the cadence and the rhythm that I want. And I just don't think it's possible cinematic um, until we get a larger team, until we get more money, until we have a dedicated team of editors. I think found footage is where we're going to be. And I'm looking forward to next year, you know, trying to make four found footage movies. I think it's completely in the realm of possibility. Um, I think it's just a matter of just execution and, you know, getting all the pieces to the puzzle to, you know, start to work. I completely agree. I'm on the same mindset and I hate found footage, although I'm warming up more and more and more and more. So thank you, Ashley, again, for turning the tide of this. And again, I think it's the loving community of everyone online. I think that's what's really honestly turned me around to it in the sense that I'm I'm looking forward to making these found footage movies. I'm excited about it. And I think it's exactly what you mentioned. It allows your momentum to continue. So that's going to go ahead and wrap up part two of how to make a low budget indie found footage film and again if you ever have any questions or anything like that feel free to join our discord we always want to help out however we can we are dbs films we make movies for our fans with our fans so we really want to go ahead and continue that model not only for other filmmakers but for actors for special effects all of those fun things as well so be sure to join us online until then have a good one <laughs>